you have published two poetry books, mm -hmm. uh, Allegory of the Supermarket in, in 19, 1998, and then Domestic Interior in 2008. And your work has been included in several anthologies, American Poetry, The Next Generation, By the Electric, 25 Years of American's Best Poetry, and four editions of the Best American Poetry. And you have published in many literary journals, and you have received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Where did all this start, and what is your first memory of poetry? Um, well, now it's been six editions of the Best American <laughs> Poetry, or seven, I don't know. But um, Congratulations. I know, thank you. <laughs> I just have to add that. Um, my first memory is really reading poetry, learning to read, and um, I grew up in a big family. There were mm -hmm. six kids. And so there were a lot of books around and things from older brothers and sisters that I could just sort of have. So one was um, Robert Louis Stevenson's Child's Garden of Verses. So I have a very distinct memory of learning to read, being in my bedroom and reading those poems like Block City and some of those simple poems for kids and just loving it and feeling total happiness. Mm. And then we also had this book that was a large book, um, like the Golden Book of Poetry, and it had illustrations. It had everything from, say, Lewis Carroll, you know, um, um, Emily Dickinson, and and you know, all, and then things that were sort of more for kids. But they were all by, they were all by, you know, good American Major poets. poets yeah. yeah. And I read that for years, and uh, I just always loved it. And when I was a kid, around the same time, I was once I started to read, I started to write, and I would write stories. And so to me, it was all the same thing. And I remember showing my dad my story, and he said, that's great. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to go do that again. Right now, I'm going upstairs and writing another one. <laughs> so it was all tinged with happiness and uh, good feelings. And then when, when did you start writing more seriously? All, I wrote always, always from childhood and always thought of myself as a writer mm. and uh, always said I wanted to be a writer and a mother. Those were my things I wanted to do. <laughs> and I wrote always. And I would write funny poems while I watched TV and show them to my parents. And, you know, it was just sort of a thing. I, I never questioned it. And then when I got older, um, when I went to college, you know, I... I wanted to, you know, I always thought of myself as a writer. So then I found out, okay, there's this whole thing where you can get an MFA in writing. So I pursued that. And um, because that was, the degree would help, would make you a teacher, you know, ideally at college. And back then, this was the 80s, so it was really hard to get jobs. I mean, there weren't very many places available. So at the same time as a child, I had loved the library and I actually card cataloged all my books which I also felt that great feeling of happiness. <laughs> and so then I thought I had worked in libraries, so I thought, well, I'll go get an MLS degree so I can do that as a job. And putting my poetry first always, that this is my essential self and the job works with it. Hmm. Yeah. You say that there are two types of poems. One percent of the time you have the title and the poem comes later unbidden and almost mm -hmm. finished. And then 99% of the time, the poem grows out of lines and it is completed with much revision. You also say that this particular poem, uh, The Satanist Next Door, that appears in your book, Domestic Interior, uh, is a received poem, right. uh, which is only like 1% uh, of the time. Yes. So could you uh, explain this a little more? OK, um, I think um, that poem uh, I had the title, and it was it was going along in my head for a long time, and then finally my husband and I had a conversation, which I basically transcribed. Um, and it's I I often have titles that I like that I wish would become a poem, and they don't always work out that way. But so it's more unusual. Um, usually you work on it, and then the title comes something from the poem. The, the title, the book, my first book, uh, um, Allegory of the Supermarket, that came, that was a title, and then I wrote the poem. So those are probably only a couple that I've ever done like that, but um, they both came with no, almost no revision. Once mm. the poem was written, I didn't really change anything. And they sort of, 
they felt unbidden in that. I didn't, they just sort of came from almost like a source out there working through me. Yeah, when, when poets say that, it always feels very like, um, uh, what's the word, um, esoteric. Right, yeah. But, it, <laughs> but it's, it's a very good way to, to describe it. Like yeah. it's, it's like, like almost like the poem goes through you and you just write whatever is, uh, yeah. is there. I think that's true. I think lines, when you, know, you hear a line in your head and then it becomes a poem, I think those are coming from somewhere maybe in you, but a lot. I always feel that they're coming in through my ear. In the same interview, you talk about uh, the uh, revision process, and you say that if you wait too long mm -hmm. to work on a poem, you may find that the poem uh, are written in a different voice, mm -hmm. in a voice that is not yours anymore, that is too late. Yes. How much, how much time do you wait, or how long do you wait? Um, I'm, uh, that would be if they were sitting for several years um, what I had the experience of was going back and looking at poems years later that I found that were really good, and I just abandoned them. And I, I didn't, I couldn't write in that style anymore, the voice anymore. It was young, too young. But lately, I have gone through and I'm looking back at things I wrote even in graduate school, and I'm, I'm revising some of them. And what I'm finding is I'm just taking out the parts that I like, and I'm not necessarily trying to put them into a narrative structure. I'm just sort of leaving them as is, which is a really different kind of style for me, because normally I think of a beginning and an end rather than having anything that's just sort of mysterious. But I'm really drawn to that direction now, or things where you can't necessarily know what the poem means particularly. And that's never appealed to me, but all of a sudden I'm just trusting in that. So these odd little you know, five line things, uh -huh. I'll just use those. And that's been fun to do. Um, in, in your um, uh, writing process, you say that you don't have a writer's group. No. Uh, who is your first reader? My husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do all the reading and editing myself. Um, I've come to really trust my own instincts. Um, I think I have a, a really good uh, so I love to revise, and I love, I trust my thinking on it, and then I just let him read it. And then if he finds anything that stands out that's sort of, sort of odd or, or calls attention to itself mm -hmm. too much, like, or it echoes something in popular culture that'll, that'll distract the poem or something, I'll change it, and then I just send it to editors at that point. I was thinking about you reading uh, the, the poem we talk about, The Satan is Next Door. Satanist next door. What is that? Is that a kid? Is that Tom? No, it's her. Ew, I think that's a whip. No, it's a hand coming down hard. No, listen, there's like a wind sound to it. I need to go to the bathroom. That one was fake. Are you still awake? She probably has to do that to get him to finish. Listen, he sounds like an angel. No one has 10 orgasms in 20 minutes. I can't tell. Oh yeah, a lot of those were fake. They're up all night doing meth and they have to have sex all the time. Should we do it now? Did that make you horny? No, but we are awake. In fact, it's creepy to hear people. She's a moaner. It's getting light out. Close the windows. The seals are barking. I like that sound. Can you hear the parrots? Oh yeah. They live across the street in the canyon. I think I smell that chemical smell. Close the windows. Do you think they ever put spells on us? Whatever you think is happening, it's not happening. It's all a lie? Mm-hmm. It sort of scares me. Freedom of religion? Yeah, you're right. And we have the Jehovah's Witnesses on the other side. It balances things. I'm going to put a holy card of St. Michael on the fence between us. God will protect us. Turn on your side. I'm going to read a quote okay. uh, from you. You say, if I have an emotional reaction to something that I have written, if I cry and feel perched, I almost always find that this is not a good poem. Mm -hmm. Ones that I dismiss often turn out to be the poem to follow. Yeah, that's true. Um, especially when I, I will often get an urge to write and I'll have a poem that's like I'm saying, it's like a, a line coming through and I'll write some of it. 
And then oftentimes I'll get an intense emotion and write about it and let myself be really self-indulgent. And those always veer off into sentimentality it's at a certain point. And when I go back and read them later, it'll, I'll, it'll have felt really good, but it, uh, they never are. I don't, they never are, nothing about them. So to me, those are sort of like warm-ups or going on a run or something, it's sort of getting, getting that out of you. And it's more like a, a journal entry. Whereas a lot of times, the weird, odd things that didn't make any sense, when you go back and look at them again, you can you know, pull more out of them. And those tend to be, I think, the more interesting things. In other words, you weren't ready for it yet. You maybe were doing something ahead of yourself. And then you can go back and, and, and look at it and work with it. You are an expert at uh, putting together these pieces that apparently don't have any connection. Uh -huh. They look very fragmented. Uh -huh. And then uh, you know, when, you, when you read the whole poem together, there is something that you, that you uh, receive from, from it. Yeah, I've often found sometimes, there's a poem in my first book called Feminine Intuition. Those were three separate poems I had been working on separately. And then when I put them together, they worked as one poem. So that I, I definitely do do that as a technique. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, in your poems, uh, we find a lot of lists and mm -hmm. repetitions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there is a poem, there are many examples, but this is just one of them. From a domestic interior, there is a poem called Coloring Book. Mm -hmm. And you say, this generation draws the lines. This generation draws inside the lines. This generation draws outside the lines. This generation cries, we, 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 all the way home. <laughs> and there are many other examples. Um, could you talk about this uh, attraction to the anaphora in your, mm -hmm. in your, in your poetry? I think, some t I think for all of those that I wrote like that, um, it's just the way I heard it in my mind. So um, it, it, just, it just comes out that way the in way. my mind. And I, do, I guess I do like anaphora. Honestly, I wasn't that aware that I did it till several people pointed it out to me. <laughs> um, you have a very good social ear. Mm -hmm. um, you pick up uh, what people say, yeah. and then you, not only what they say, but how they say it, and then you um, insert that in your, in your poems. My work was, has been described as sociological sometimes, mm -hmm. and so I, I am very much interested in the way people act and um, what they say and what they do. I'm very observant. I'm a good mimic with my voice, mm -hmm. I mean, things like that. Um, so that really interests me. Um, I'm very interested in human behavior. But what's interesting in, with my work now is I'm trying to go away from that a little bit. I want to be less talking about the world and I want to be talking more about um, almost like mystical states and things like that or observing natural states rather than being so much about society. And I think it's because I'm more attracted to those poems that don't readily give up their meaning so easily. And that's different for me, and I'm trusting that that's a good direction to go in. Do you have any samples of, of that style in, um, the, in the pieces you have brought? Let me see. Here it is. Okay, so this one, this one, um, this is one where I'm describing something, and then the turn I took in the poem, I left, I left, I, as I wrote it, I didn't, I heard this line, which was the last line, and normally I would have gone in and, and added a bunch of things in it to explain it better, but I didn't. I just trusted in the, the connection. So you'll see what I mean when I read it. Beach glass. If something's tossed around enough by violent changes, the edges do go soft, the sharpness dulls. Green glass would have been a bottle broken by someone careless. Fuck them for that. It would have required stitches in the foot that caught it, walking on it, surfer, tourist baby, looking to the water, looking to the mother, not thinking of what was underfoot. But that wasn't what happened to it. It became part of the movement. It washed up on the shore, ready to be found. Thick, green, now cloudy and soft to the fingertip that touches it. After a certain age, my father didn't bother with anger or arguments. I like to have more mystery. The mystery, I think, is really, is really something that we all like and we all want. And I tend to write really long poems, and I find I, used to, I don't want to read those anymore, and I don't want to write them. <laughs> <laughs> and, I want to, and I want to see a lot of interesting musicality or 
um, interesting uses of language rather than something that's really long explaining a scene, which tends to be the way I wrote. I feel like that's what people want from poetry now is something that helps them spiritually or um, emotionally. Sometimes uh, in the middle of a repetition or in the middle of what appears like a list of trivial sentences, you drop something heavy, substantial, as in passing. Um, it's almost as if you, uh, you put some light on a dark corner and then you keep walking again. <laughs> um, and for example, you reveal uh, things about a mentally ill sister, alcoholism, antidepressants, a brother's serial illness, do you have a name for this? Uh, for this? <laughs> no, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. Kind of a trick I've learned is to do that, and I, I go towards humor a lot. So I do that because um, it, 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 just, it just feels like a good moment um, in, in the poem. It's like a real turn. Often it just comes to my mind that way, and so when it comes to me that way, I'm like, wow, that's great. I love that. Cause <laughs> But um, sometimes I'll erase and take it out. But um, there's a lot of times in life you're just doing stuff, but really there's this whole inner dialogue going on or this inner meaning to what's going on. Um, I find that they're usually emotional moments, and it highlights the emotional moment. The other thing I like about that is um, to put it in the middle of something like that versus doing it at the end and revealing it all at the very end, because I think sometimes that feels too um, formulaic. Yes. I have uh, a new poem that kind of does that too, if you want me to read yes. it. Um, it's called A Foreign Country. A Foreign Country. Mm -hmm. I can't come to work today. My son has a brain tumor. Tommy can't come to school today. He has a brain tumor. I said something like this, but my voice was cracking. It was Monday at 8 o'clock. I'd woken up at the children's hospital. It was a January morning. It was really hot. I looked out the window. The hills were beautiful. I never thought I'd be here. Didn't think I'd be talking about a brain tumor. Didn't know that morning about oleodendromas, astrocytomas, the dreaded brainstem glioma. That day my son died. He lived a shorter lifespan. He outlived me. The doctor was a pro. If this were my kid, this is what I'd do. Take it out tomorrow at 2 p.m. So my intuition spoke as my body was reacting with fear, with chills, with tears, with dread. It was going to work out. He was going to live. Sometimes the tumors just pop right out, the nurse said. She was cheery. We were all watching Cash Cab on TV before he left for surgery. I don't want to die a virgin, Tommy said. He is a 14-year-old boy, after all. He has a lot of things ahead. The tumor was removed, nothing left that would grow. The night before the tumor spoke as a seizure which left him writhing on the floor, I dreamed that I was on a ferry boat. As we capsized, I was thrown like a person shot out of a cannon. I felt like I was on the giant drop of a roller coaster. I dropped and dropped and couldn't stop. I fell neatly into the shallow water, surfaced, and walked to the edge of a river, calm in my wet dress. Tommy stood waiting for me. We went back to the launch. There were phone, phones to use, and people gladly gave me coins. They said they could get me on the next flight home. How kind they were waiting to help me. I noticed how willing they were. All I had to do was ask. There we were, all alone in a foreign country, and I wasn't afraid. And the trick there is the going from these serious things to where my son says, I don't want to die a virgin, which is really what he said. But um, I threw it in there because it's sort of hopeful and, and humorous in this weird situation. And um, a couple other things I did like that was saying that it was January, but it was hot, and you're looking out at the windows, but you're thinking of these, these other serious thoughts. You have this kind of dialogue between the librarian you yeah. and, the, and the writer you. It's been a really good job for me because um, I know all about what people really read, and so, and that's a good thing to know. There's this whole world out there of really successful writers who write mystery novels that some are very good, some are not, or they write, you know, literary fiction, um, young adult novels. And I'm very aware of what's going on with, you know, the book, where book publishing is going. 
so in that case, I feel very informed about those things. Um, to me, they're just wonderful sides of the same thing, of just being around, um, you know, words and books and information. And I, to me, it's just kind of a uh, a paradise, I guess, in a <laughs> sense. I think before there was such an online world, I always felt a little bit out of it. I wasn't real involved with a lot of poetry things because I wasn't around colleges that where people taught and stuff. But now it all seems sort of seamless. Um, how, um, have you seen any major difference, like bef because you have been working mm -hmm. at Celebrina for a, for a while, so yeah. like before and after the um, the ebook or yes, the it's huge and it's a big. Uh, we're we're like the people in Gutenberg's time when who went from oral to written. Mm -hmm. So we don't really because we're so into it right now. I don't think we can necessarily see it very well. Right now, I believe we're in a hybrid situation where. There's print and then there's ebooks and there tends to be people do one or the other. That's been the case. Now things are going just to ebook. And now what we're finding is there's a lot more interest in libraries and there hasn't been any sort of self published books or platforms that publish books like Juke Pop is one and mm -hmm. even Books on Tape, which is a pretty old company, is gonna do one. So in other words, they're finding new ways to find content outside the editor model. There's more emphasis now on the beautiful book. If it's going to be a book, it's going to be beautiful versus a trashy, ugly paperback with acidic pages that rot. Um, and then the ebook will probably become the more book that you just read and casually and um, you know give away, toss away. But there's a whole lot of things it affects. It affects for instance, friends of the library group sell old books to raise money for libraries. Well, if they're all ebooks, they're not going to be able to sell them. So it changes a lot of models that we have in the live branches that I um, oversee. I'm encouraging them to get rid of shelving um, and have less books in some of them so that they have more room for people to sit because now the library has become a place people want to come and work. Mm. A lot of people don't have offices. So the library has adapted since, you know, ancient times and it will continue to. Actually publishing a book and seeing it and going through that submission process for so many years, it really felt like a huge accomplishment. And I'm wondering what that will feel like for people in the future if that's gone. On the other hand, maybe it will be better and it will be less um, that there's an elitist group versus the rest of the people. Could you... Um Talk a little bit about your uh, your new manuscript. Um, my new manuscript um, is a lot of work that I've written um, in having gone through some um, extreme situations, one of which was my son's brain tumor. These poems are less funny and they're more uh, have a serious kind of tone. So um, I am adding in a lot of those ones that I described to that have less. I'm trying to have, you know, those ones that are shorter and have less um, conclusions. Hmm. And however, though, when I look through this, um, you know, there's a lot that are long, two pages long, so I may not even know my own work. <laughs> <laughs> um, which uh, poem would you like to read to, to close the interview? Um, I have selected uh, one, which mm -hmm. was uh, the library poem, since uh, you're a librarian. But I can read that one. Okay. Now this one too is one that um, I started hearing its rhythms while I was sitting on the reference mm -hmm. desk waiting to help patrons and just watching what was going on. And then I went on my break and wrote it and then, you know, edited it later. And most of these things happened ex on that very day except for a couple. Library and it has a quote from Andrew Carnegie. There is not such a cradle of democracy upon the earth as the, f as the free public library. Potions and lotions, which all smell gross, and regressions to the past, the past self. Pierced tongue, pink hair, potty mouth, voodoo doo-doo, wick and crap, fake religion born out of the Englishman's loss of the oral trad, taken up by this Betty Page tattooed elf, doing spells via the internet, which I can see over her shoulder, me, the neutral, bring her to info in the building of the free housing and retrieval of information, and so I go like a psychopomp between the conscious and the unconscious world, bringing her and the guy who gambles away online his social security checks each time and therefore sleeps on our patio. 
and help each one log on to cyberspace, words invented by William Gibson, an American novelist, I believe, and help them print their pages from the screen. Here you go. I stand beside with no opinion, with no interpretation, and besides, there is someone else now who needs a guide to oil painting, and here he needs a book by an author that is translated from the Thai language and the fourth request today for Romeo and Juliet in PBK. Our drunk walks to the front door carrying today's newspaper. Excuse me, you can't take that out of here. He is, he thinks, my pal. He pats me on the back. I'm busted. I have no opinion. I cannot interpret taxes. Here is the form. I cannot give you advice for that, sir. My mother has Alzheimer's. I need to know. How can I find out about fetal alcohol syndrome, the baby we adopted? I offer her a tissue, and we walk to the shelf. This is just a house. I will guide you between worlds. Take this. Here it is. But now I must go. Now there is someone else who needs that stupid trashy book by a misguided author freak that everyone's reading. Yes, we have it. I give it with no advice and no opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a really fun way to spend the afternoon. <laughs>